So my name is Daniela Kularva, and I'm going to talk about uh, automata-based programming or using finite state machines in software development. I'm not going to talk about me a lot. I'm just going to tell you that I'm a, actually a senior software architect in DXC. And during my daily work, I had to work with a framework for finite state machines. That's why I decided to do a bit more research and compare different solutions and compare different design approaches. So <clears throat> today, I'm going to talk a bit about the term, uh, about the history of finite state machines, just a slide, of course. I'm not uh, planning to do it too boring for you. I'm going to talk a bit about the applications and uh, not going to talk about math, but at least I have to give a definition about finite state machines. And then uh, we'll an analyze a very, very simple example and uh, use an Eclipse uh, editor um, to actually see and analyze different design approaches, how it can be done. So at any time, you're welcome to give me ideas what can be done better, or if something is not clear, to ask, to ask questions. <clears throat> so, what is automata-based programming? I actually was surprised that uh, I haven't heard about this term. I have heard a lot about finite state machines. What about you? I mean, can you uh, raise a hand or people who have heard, used, or learned about finite state machines? Cool, quite a lot. And what about automata-based programming? Okay, one. <laughs> Well, uh, it is just the definition of the programming uh, when people use finite state machines for software modeling. It is not something new. It, finite state machines uh, exist already quite a lot of time. They were widely used in um, domains like um, uh, formal languages analysis, but actually they were further investigated in order to apply them for um, modeling other solutions in software. So, uh, in general, the definition stays a programming techniques in which um, a program or part of it is modeled uh, as a finite state machine, then it's automata-based programming. Actually, the term is quite new. It was first mentioned uh, in 1997 on a multi-agent conference in Russia by uh, two people uh, Polycarpov and Shaleto. They actually uh, wrote a book, it's in Russian, Automatne Programmerivanie. Uh, they also have articles in English where they call it automata based programming or switch technology. We'll see why. I, I guess you know. So, actually, uh, finite state machine uh, exists quite a lot from the previous century. As you probably know, automata theory is a branch of computer um, science. And it's interesting that the first people that considered uh, abstract machines, finite state machines, among the first people were uh, biologists, physiologists, mathematicians, engineers, and some of the first people, some of the first computer scientists. What I have in common well, actually, they have in common the interest in modeling uh, the human thought process. And <clears throat> but the first people who tried to describe, to define the state machines in an article were Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts, two neurophysiologists in 1943. And this paper is actually um, commonly regarded as the inception of two uh, research fields. One of them is automata theory, applied for modeling computation. And the second one is artificial neural networks, which is quite interesting. At least it was for me when I found it out. So uh, 
I will just mention an additional thing, 1967, uh, Marvin Minsky, I guess lots of people here have heard the name, one of the AI pioneers. Well, he wrote a book, Computation, Finite and Infinite Machines, one book which is not really on AI, but on the computational power of uh, abstract machines, including finite state machines. And 2015, we have Spring State Machine. It is actually uh, where I started. As part of my daily work, I had a task to um, analyze an existing finite state machine framework, an internal one, and compare it with other solutions which are available. One of them was Spring. So I had to find the common parts, the good parts, the bad parts and um, actually give an answer to some people if it's better or if our solution can be replaced with something that is already there on the, on the internet, which is free to use. I'm still doing it. But let's, uh, let's go a bit back and analyze again and talk about uh, the applications of finite state machines. Because when I started, I mentioned that they were commonly used in formal language analysis, but they actually found during the years many, many other applications. So I took this from the book of the um, people who invented the term automata based programming, Sholaito and Polikarpova. They tried to summarize the applications based on types of systems, and they defined transformation. They, they are actually categorization as transformation systems, systems which get an input and transform it somehow, uh, like compilers, ar archivers, interactive systems like text editors, which actually um, communicate with their environment, and reactive systems like tele telecommunication systems and hardware con controllers, which also um, communicate with their environment but um, in a timely manner. They, they have to react on time, on incoming, let's say, input or events. And now a bit more pragmatically, the applications. Finite state machine is hardware, finite state machines in hardware. Uh, well, it's something which is also very popular right now. It's out of scope for this presentation. Although I added a book at the end in the list of present uh, in the list of references, because it's something which is considered even harder than software development of finite state machines. As already mentioned, programming language compilers, lexical analyzers, things like that. I think most of us has at least once touched this topic at the university. Workflow modeling, this is the uh, area where I work, using uh, finite state machines to model uh, processing workflows. There are people in this room who also know this. I saw you. <laughs> and game programming. I guess there are people here who also do that. Uh, at least for uh, behavioral modeling, it is <coughs> very popular to apply finite state machines. And the last one, state machines replication. It is um, something which is um, a concept used for the implementation of fault tolerance services. And now let's try to define what a finite state machine is. It's an abstract machine because um, actually automata theory um, is not only about finite state machines, it's about also other um, abstr abstract machines. But we are going to consider today one of the, or actually the simplest one. It's an abstract machine which can be in exactly one state. <clears throat> and can be in a finite state uh, and uh, uh, yeah, in one state. 
but it can change from one state to another state, state in response to um, an external input, let's say in an, an event. <clears throat> uh, this changing the state from one to another is called transition. So if you want to, def if you want to define a finite state machine, we can say it's com comprised of a set of states, an initial state, which is the one when a finite state machine is started, and a set of transitions. If you have to define it in a bit more formal way, we can say, yeah, it has a set of states and a start state. It has a set of inputs, set of outputs. It has a transition function, which based on an input and the current state, actually changes the state of the, state of the finite state machine. And it had an output function. Well, there are different types of output functions based on that if uh, the output depends on the input or the current state or only the current state. Let's take a look at uh, an example. I guess lots of people know this example. I choose it because it was the one that um, was mentioned in Robert Martin's book, Agile Software Development. Maybe it's worth mentioning that it is one of his favorite modeling techniques. <clears throat> so uh, it's also mentioned in many, many articles, including Wikipedia article about finite state machine. That's why um, I, th I thought it's good to base our design approach on this one. It is actually a subway turn style state machine. I've chosen two um, representation techniques here. Um, to show you the, the, this example. One of them is, them is very popular, state transition di diagram. And the other one is um, a very simple state transition table. So the state transition diagram actually um, has four um, elements. It has states, which are represented um, via bubbles, locked and unlocked. It has transitions, which are uh, represented via the arrows, by the arrows. And its arrow actually has uh, a label. And this label is, um, uh, contains the um, input or event and corresponding action. The same information is also represented in the state transition table. It represents the state's events, actions to be performed, and the target state. So if a turnstile is actually in a locked state and someone passes a coin, someone try, uh, sorry, so, someone tried to pass the turnstile without passing a coin, it will sound an alarm and it will stay in locked state. If uh, it is in locked state but someone passes a coin, the action will be unlock the turnstile and uh, the state will be unlocked. So we're going to see it a bit more later in code, how it is coded. But first of all, um, I'll present you the first uh, design approach, which I took out from uh, Robert Martin's book. So, um, it's something you already know. As Shaleto and Polikarpova called it switch technology, this approach is based on um, switch case statements. So how to uh, code the transitions? Well, it's a very easy to use switch case statement. I will try to open my Eclipse. So, in order to make it easier and not lose too much time, I've defined um, some of the things. First, in order to define a state machine, as we already said, we need a, a set of we need a set of states. So I defined an enumeration. Of course, it's not obligatory to use an enumeration. I decided to, use, to do it in a very simplistic way. So our enumeration has two states, locked and unlocked. I also define the possible events that might occur. So, um, 
So it's turnstile event, sorry, coin, when we put a coin, pass, when someone tries to pass the turnstile. I also defined an interface which represents our turnstile finite state machine. It just has one method, it receives an event and reacts on it. So based on Robert Martin's ideas, I also defined a turnstile controller. The idea of this turnstile controller was to divide the actions to be performed from the turnstile, uh, from the state machine logic. So this allows us actually to um, easily replace the implementation of the turnstile controller if we want to perform some other kind of actions, but at the time, at the same time, reuse the turnstile style controller in another finite state machine with different logic. I actually used it to uh, make my testing easier. You'll see how. Because uh, the reason I uh, defined this interface was to, to actually implement one JUnit test and apply it to the different implementations, different design approaches, so that it's easier. What I also defined was an, is an abstract um, turnstile where we have an initial state and we have a turnstile controller to perform the actions. And of course, to construct it. So as I already mentioned, we'll start in a, with a very simplistic example. It is based on a switch case. I just um, extended the abstract turn style and implemented the event method. You can see it, it's, it looks pretty simple. Yeah. You can see that um, if it's locked, then if someone puts a coin, then it's unlocked. And if someone tries to pass then, and it's locked, then an alarm will sound. Cool, it's a simplistic one. And in addition, all the logic is on one place. So if I want to understand how it works, I just uh, can go to the code, take a look, and say, yeah, I can understand it. But imagine right now, if there are much more states and much more events, and you have to each time do updates of this code with a few screens of switch case statements. It becomes hard to uh, change, hard to understand. So it's pretty much obvious that we are going to do a lot of regression tests, uh, a lot of regression errors. <clears throat> in addition, um, in articles I found about this approach, it was mentioned that if you want uh, to pass information to a particular state, in this case, then you, uh, you, you cannot do it. We ha you have to pass it to all the code. At the same time, do you think it's thread safe? Not really. Let's go to another example. State pattern. We've all heard a lot about design patterns. We've seen lots of them, I guess. Well, if you search in Google, if just Google finite state machines implementation, then there are lots of articles containing um, approaches or using this approach, applying uh, state design pattern for the implementation of finite state machines. Robert Martin also likes it, so he also uh, wrote about this in his book. It is something which is not um, really complex. We have a context and we have a state. And actually, um, the idea of this pattern is that the context stays the same, but its behavior is changed once we change his state. 
And the behavior is actually coded in the states, which are um, subclasses of the state. So we have an interface, we have implementations. We reassign this um, state and that's fine. Let's go again to the code. I have also tried this approach. So in order to do this, according to the pattern definition, I had to define a state. I'm not using the uh, state enumeration anymore because the behavior will be coded there. So I decided to do a new one. So I decided to implement this the following way. I have a state pattern, an interface with two methods. One for a coin, one for the path. Of course, um, they have two implementations, one for the unlock state and one for the lock state. The unlock state, if a coin is passed, but it's unlocked, then it will just say thank you. But if it's unlocked and um, you pass, actually, it is obvious that it should be locked again, which means uh, I will call the controller and say a lock, and I'll change the state to locked. So at the same time, if um, it is locked, if I put a, a coin, it will unlock. But if I try to pass, and it's obviously locked, then the alarm will sound. Quite simple. But you've probably seen something that it's one of the disadvantages of uh, state design pattern. It's actually uh, this one. Each of these methods has a parameter which is the implementation of the state machine. So in order to control it, to change its state, or to call the controller, it gets a um, reference to the state machine. So the context knows about the state, but the state also knows about the context. So it's, they're a bit tightly coupled. I, of course, analyze this and try to find workarounds, but we'll talk a bit later about this. I just wanted to show you that before uh, going to the implementation. About the implementation, we all want to um, extend the same ter turnstile interface, eventually reuse the abstract turnstile. So I did it. I have an abstract turnstile. This time the state is uh, of a different type, but, but Java generics allowed, allowed us this. I have two states, locked states and unlocked state. Uh, for simplicity, they are instantiated here. Not only for simplicity, but because they have no state, it uh, allows me to reuse the instances. So I don't have to uh, create new instances each time I want to reuse them. And now the methods. I have a coin method, I have a pass method, and I just call, delegate the call to the uh, internal state. So when it is once it is changed, I don't care about the real logic, I'll just delegate to the state. It seems easy, looks pretty much easy, but what about the event method? It turns out that I somehow forgot about the event method and th thought that if the design pattern um, is a good solution, then it will solve my problem as well. But not really, because what I did is I created this method and now the responsibility for deciding which method coin or pass to call is moved away from the turnstile, but it is the responsibility of the client code. So now the client has to decide coin or path and then call the turnstile. It's a bit different than the other approach where I base it only on an input event. 
So I, the, the workaround I found was still to use the abstract, the, still to use the turnstile interface, implement the event method, but play a bit with Java 8 method references. So what I did is I created a kind of method registry. registry. And there is a key or identifier of the methods based on the event. So when I got a turnstile event, I search in the registry, I find the event, uh, I find the method, and I just call it with a particular reference of the current state and a reference to the turnstile. If you want to take a look at the, at the registry, let's go first to the definition. It's a map. The key is the turnstile event, and uh, the value is a big consumer, one of the uh, functional interfaces provided by Java 8. So, it just use it. It's a simple hash map. The way I initialize it is using the method references of the state. You've probably seen that this is not a particular state, this is a class. That's why I'm passing the instance right here in order to be able to call the method on the right instance, which is the current state of the turnstile. So, this is the way I did it. And now, when we already have seen two implementation of the turnstile, let's go to the JUnit test. I tried to reuse it, but it wasn't able I wasn't able before because if I don't have an event method, if I don't have an interface, I cannot reuse the JUnit test the way I want. So by doing this, just take a look of the turnstile with, switched, with the switch case statement test. It has just an um, uh, instantiation method which just provides the, the right instance. And the real implementation is in an abstract interface which doesn't care which implementation uh, it tests. It just has an instance. It has a setup, we'll take a look a bit later. And it has different use cases to test. But what's interesting here is, remember we talked about the, um, the turnstile controller, that we divided it and we uh, were able to implement it in a different way. So here's one of the usages. Instead of using the real controller, which performs the actions, I'm just defining one here for the test. And the only thing it does is changing some um, flex, which I am later using to check if the test passes or not. So quite simple, I'm not, not tied to a real implementation. And reusable. Here is the test of the turnstile, uh, of the state-based turnstile. The same thing, just an implementation provided. Okay, so um, I guess you've, most of you or have read about the state pattern. You know the advantages, disadvantages. What we achieved with this example was that we uh, really divided the processing of the event in the particular processing based on a state in different state implementations. So we distributed the logic across implementation of the state pattern. And if you, want to if you want to change the strategy of processing, we just reassign a variable, the state variable, in the turnstile, and we change the behavior of the turnstile, which is, of course, one of the advantages of this pattern. Uh, the advantage that I already mentioned is that we perform tight coupling between the two. So, 
That's fine. But let's imagine again that we have hundreds or let's say 20 more, 20 more states. So now we'll create 20 more implementations of the state pattern, of the state interface, and we'll actually code the logic there. I actually find it again hard to go to each and every implementation if I have to understand what the logic is. It's again, we end up with distributed logic, which from one side is good, but from the other side, it's again hard for our brains to follow everything there. So, um, we ha have to consider an additional approach, which is al also mentioned in Robert Martin's book, a bit different. You'll see how different. Oops, sorry. The next one is state transition table. It actually resembles the state transition table we saw before on the slide. And it's just coded with, in our case, with Java or any programming language. So, what Robert Martin did in his book, actually, and what I tried at the beginning, was to define a transition, a transition class, which has a current state, an event, the new state, and an action to be performed. Well, it's pretty simple. It's actually representing a row from the state transition table. And what he did, he then uh, stored all these transitions representing rows from the, tables you've, from the table you've seen in a list. And once an event comes, he just uh, iterates over the list, finds the corresponding simple uh, zump, uh, transition with the car based on the current state on the event, and calls its action and change the states of the turnstile. Well, I observed this um, solution a bit, analyzed it, and I found out that there is actually a key. Each transition can be identified based on the current state of the turnstile and based on the event, incoming event. So why using a list when we have an ob obviously a key? So for a programmer, it's pretty much intuitive that it's candidate for a hash map or some a similar solution. So what I did was um, define a key which is, sorry, not this one, define a key based on the state and event, and use it in the hash map. I'm showing you it has an equals and hash code. So based on this key, I'm, I'm using it and um, storing the transitions. And each transition has the new state or the next state and an action. I may be Miss that one. I forgot to mention that the action is just a simple interface because I'm using Java 8. It's a functional interface with one method. So, what I did was in the constructor of the new implementation, I'm storing for each possible row in the state transition table the corresponding transition with the target, uh, target action and with an action implementation. So, you probably see for each row, there were, I think, four rows. I have four such statements. And the event method just finds the right transition based on the state of the turnstile and the incoming event, executes the action, and reassigns the state 
to the target state or the new state. So most of you prob probably uh, have seen that this code is a bit long and a bit complex. Uh, if I have to go through it, it's, well, with these anonymous classes. Let's take a look at the second implementation. What about this one? Again, my favorite method references. So, yeah, I, I'm not pretend. I, I'm I'm not sure it's the best solution, but it's a better one. <laughs> the event the event method is the same. It just gets the action. It just reassigns the current state, and that's it. I played a bit with the third one. Also, most probably not the best one, but because it's very modern the last few years to use builders and fluent APIs, I also created a one with a builder, which says on state event, do this action and this action, and actually, uh, I'm sorry that you cannot see the code very good, I guess, but all the code is available in my GitHub hub repository, so you can go and test. And I'll be happy to contact me, give me better ideas, or tell me this code looks awful. You have to delete it, rewrite it, everything. So, I have the same JUnit test for this solution based on the state pattern, based on the, sorry, on the state transition table. As a matter of fact, um, the order that Robert Martin uh, chose in his book, Agile Software Development, wasn't the, the same. He started with the uh, switch case statement, then went on through uh, the state transition table. Uh, he his comments were that this solution is not the best one, it's kind of inefficient. And then he presented the state pattern as a better solution. I changed this order because I kind of like a bit more the state transition table approach, especially with the usage of Java 8 and the hash map, because I don't think it's so inefficient really. And it is actually more uh, readable because I can see the definitions, all these definitions of the state transition table are on one place. I can see them exactly, well, most probably because I'm used to read code, but I can see this one very much that resembles the real table as it is represented graphically. So for me at least, it's it looks better. I have the, uh, everything on one place. If I have to add an additional transition, I'll add a row here, so it's much easier to me. Uh, at the same time, if I use a builder, I can extract the strategy of building it. I can even hide the map behind the wrapper and apply different strategies for uh, the structure I'm using to, to store the transitions which gives me some flexibility. So if we go back to the presentation, sorry. What we defined was, um, what we called it was a state transition table. So I already mentioned, we defined the logic on one place it's easier to add new transitions. We increase the efficiency compared to the list. We increase the read readability. And it's easy for us to validate the, uh, the, the definition in the code against the graphical representation. <clears throat> Maybe I should add something in addition to this. Um, Based on the functional interface we defined, it allowed us also 
I showed you um, a usage of method references, also lambdas. But it happens very often that the projects are old and you are not allowed to use Java 8. People there know what I'm talking about. Uh, so you can use, you can still use implementations of the action. That's that's fine. But uh, this notion of action also allows us to play with uh, multi-threading. An action may be a wrapper of something that runs a task or yeah, particular action a task uh, in a thread, in a separate thread. Or another approach would be to um, use the action method and, eat, and run each action in a separate thread. I'm telling you that because in the, on the project I'm working on, there is a strategy for running tasks um, in parallel by running them in separate threads, but there is also a strategy to run a particular task on a grid. But all this is hidden behind the implementation of the framework so that I just have to configure a flag there and say, run it. Of course, it's not so simple, but it looks like this. So um, I'm also almost done. Um, I also um, played a bit with this turnstile. You can see the code if you're interested. I created um, a um, generic implementation. What I tried was to extract the um, common logic, use a bit more generics, and define a turn style, which uh, define a finite state machine implementation, which can be used also in other use cases, not only for the turn style. <clears throat> if, if we have time, we can take a look, but I prefer first, yeah, I also added some references if you're interested in. But um, I prefer to uh, leave some time for questions, and if we have time, we can go back to the code and take a look at the generic one. Thank you for now. And if you have any questions. Nice to meet you. Uh, so my question is, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, hello, so my question is regarding uh, the, how hard it is to add a new event and is it typical based on your experience in the project to change the events during the project? Well, not really easy, but it's not, maybe I have to transform the question. Um, Hard for me is not um, actually the effort I have to put, but it's uh, more or less based on how many parts of the, of the uh, implementation I have to change. If it has to be um, changed on one and two places and everything else remains the same, that's fine. So explaining this, it's not hard. I'm always aiming to... Uh, not propagate changes across across the implementation. So, yeah, this was the idea. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, sorry, there is a. Yep. Just use the microphone, please. Or I can repeat the question. It's not a problem. How you cannot uh, asynchronous call? Asynchronous call. Yeah, you can, uh, one of the, yes, I talked about it a bit uh, earlier, you can use the action because it's an interface, within it you can run it in a separate thread. Or another option would be to, to change a bit the event method. You execute the right here. Here, when you execute this one, you can wrap it here, and instead of just calling execute, run it separately. In the implementation I've seen, actually, there is a additional class, and I pass the task to the class, and it runs it in a separate thread. I guess I hope this answers the question somehow. 
Excuse me. In a real world example, how many states you end up with and how many operations? Is it, does it grow, I don't know, 100,000 operations and 500 states? I don't think so. It depends on the use case, but from what I've seen, not many states and not many actions. Do you, um, uh, do you sorry, define the state for the whole system or you have subsystem with in separate the, in states? In the system I work on, um, it is actually a process-based framework. It's written uh, internally, it's not something which is published. It's a process-based, so each process has, if, uh, has states, maybe six, seven states, and then within this process, each task has also state. So they are a bit more um, embedded, let's say, but not, they are not more than six, seven, something like that. Okay, if no more questions, I would say thank you very much.